Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to the organisers for uh, having me. Uh, it's great to be back in Helsinki. I was here in 2012 uh, during your year as a world design capital and, um, and uh, certainly uh, wherever I've been in the world, in Australia or in the UK, uh, we've often looked to uh, Finland's example about how to place design at the centre of things. Um, I'm going to do, uh, I'm conscious of time, uh, and so uh, I'm probably going to do a severe injustice to a number of uh, research reports that Nesta has done. So Nesta, for those of you who don't know, is the UK's Innovation Foundation, uh, and we help uh, people bring ideas to life through a combination of research, uh, investment programs and skills. Um, and we spent quite a bit of time over the last five or so years thinking about the role of cities uh, and uh, innovation, and how do cities uh, transform themselves to pick up Marco's point? How do we reinvent the way governments work to actually uh, deliver better outcomes for the people who live in them? And so in the, the 20 minutes that I've got, um, I'm going to look at uh, three reports. And I'm going to put them up because, um, as I say, I will do them at severe injustice. So I encourage you to go and have uh, a read of them at your leisure. Um, the, the three I want to talk about is uh, one's called Rethinking Smart Cities from the Ground Up. Um, and if you like, the question that we asked ourselves is what do we actually mean by smart cities? And can we actually move away from the sort of technology driven uh, mantra of the past to actually a much more people centered uh, approach? The second um, is the City uh, Report, which is actually looking at what is the role of cities in supporting innovation and entrepreneurship. And again, this is about transforming the way that cities uh, see their task to actually bring about uh, change. And the third one uh, on iTeams, which is actually about the role of uh, city governments uh, developing their own institutional capacity uh, for innovation. Uh, and I'll, I'll, t I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So here it goes. And apologies for the, um, uh, for the speed. Um, so to the, to the smart cities, um, we've all heard of the sort of utopian visions of smart cities. Uh, infrastructure will save us. Uh, and uh, big uh, Leviathan projects um, where uh, technology was going to be built uh, all around us and it was going to make life perfect. Um, unfortunately, that has tended not to actually be the reality. Uh, this is Mazdar in uh, the desert in the uh, United Arab Emirates. Uh, current resident population, I think, is about uh, 100. Um, it didn't work. Um, the reality of those visions, um, it, it just uh, didn't, didn't actually come uh, to fruition. More recently, uh, we've looked at uh, a slightly more grounded view of the smart city, uh, which involves the use of data and technology uh, in existing cities to improve city management, making it more efficient, improving decision making so that a city can better meet the challenges of transport, energy use, waste collection, and so on. Uh, and they use things like uh, sensors and so on to do that. Um, Sorry, um, as I say, I'm presenting someone else's report, so I, I need to make sure I do it justice. Um, the Internet of Things is also transforming the way we can do this. Um, and so uh, a lot of smart people are exploring uh, how this can happen. However, there are some challenges with both of these visions. Um, and the four we identified, the first was that there's an over-reliance on hardware and technology. Um, that um, the assumption that you, if you build these things, then the city will automatically transform itself. The second is it didn't integrate with the other work that was going on uh, in cities and in their programs. Um, the third was that there wasn't really much of a clear sense of um, the value of doing this, the return on investment. And fourth, and fundamentally, is it really didn't talk about the role of people. And so uh, the work of this report, Rethinking Smart Cities from the Ground Up, argued that actually uh, the most successful smart cities of the future will combine the best aspects of technology while making the most of the growing potential of collaborative technologies, technologies that enable greater collaboration between urban communities, between citizens and city governments. Uh, and four ways that they sort of uh, pointed to, which I think sort of uh, paint a bit of a picture of where we might go next, um, and some of these may be familiar to you, uh, some more than others. Uh, the first is around crowdsourcing. This is about finding smarter ways of collecting data um, rather than just having sensors built into the environment. Can we actually work with people in a different way uh, to have them uh, help us uh, paint a, a richer picture of what's going on in the city? Uh, this is an example from Jakarta. Um, during the floods there recently, 
um, the use of people being able to use standard non-smartphones to report uh, the situation in their area and then to be able to map this in real time to get a better sense of what was actually happening. So rather than having to build millions of sensors in the city, actually what we did was we engaged the population of Jakarta to tell us what was going on. And the information was quicker, more effective, and actually it used existing infrastructure rather than having to build uh, an entire uh, you know, hard, hardware infrastructure around uh, the, the city. This is in Japan. Uh, this is a, uh, an air quality monitoring kit. People can buy this for themselves to monitor the quality of air in their own homes for their own benefit but the information is also shared with the city government, which enables them to build a picture of what's actually happening uh, across the city and to think about um, uh, planning uh, implications and so on. The second uh, area that, uh, that we looked at was around collective intelligence. So a smart city is one that engages its citizens to make just better decisions for itself. Um, and you know, we're seeing a lot of examples of that. Uh, this is in Bangalore. Um, this is the use of uh, getting citizens to identify underutilized uh, urban space. They call them urban voids, um, where mapping and planning has not caught up with the organic development of the city. And so actually encouraging citizens to actually identify where there are spaces that are not being used and to inform uh, government so that they can be better incorporated into future development for the city. This is in Paris, participatory budgeting. Uh, one of the largest participatory budgeting exercises in the world. Uh, it's 20 million euros uh, a year. Uh, it's a 10-year project. Um, and so again, the, we're changing the way in which uh, citizens are engaging with the city. Um, and that's, we think that's a, a smarter way of working. The third, and um, Marco touched on this, is actually how do we use our resources more effectively within cities? Uh, and so the rise of the collaborative economy, the sharing economy, uh, is creating lots of different uh, opportunities for us as citizens uh, in, in cities to work together more effectively. Um, some of them uh, revolve around uh, better use of our own resources. So how do we share our cars, either by pooling them or by renting them out? How do we redesign our public transport? Here's an example from Helsinki that everyone wants to copy around the world, um, where public transport is actually sort of demand driven uh, rather than sort of something that we have to sort of design top down and, and roll out according to what transport planners think is the right thing to do. And an example from Singapore, block pooling is actually about enabling citizens, uh, giving them the, the uh, ability to actually share whatever resources they have available to, uh, to design and execute projects for themselves uh, to improve the lives of their communities. Um, and the fourth area that the, the, the researchers looked at was about helping people to shape the future of their cities and around, particularly around issues of crowdfunding. Um, and there are plenty of examples. This is just one from uh, Rotterdam, I think, in uh, the Netherlands, um, where citizens who were quite irate about the lack of a safe passage over a uh, expressway in the past would have written to their members of parliament. Uh, this, this time they actually just crowdfunded the development of the bridge. And each one of those planks you see on the right and the left is actually one of the people who actually helped to, uh, to fund this to make it possible. So again, a smart city is not just about uh, top-down um, execution using infrastructure. It's about really engaging citizens in a different way uh, to, uh, to design the future of your city. One down, two to go. <laughs> um, the second report, as I said, was looking at what is the role of cities in promoting and supporting innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, the, the role of the city uh, is changing. Uh, and so we looked at um, uh, the different kinds of roles that cities can play. Um, and we started, I guess, with sort of three broad questions. How open is the city to new ideas and new businesses? Uh, secondly, how well does the city provide the kind of infrastructure needed for businesses and new ventures to grow? And the third was how well does the city government build innovation into the way it runs its own activities? Uh, and to answer that, uh, we designed this framework that set out nine roles that a city needs to play well to support innovation in the local ecosystem. Um, one of the measures is openness, uh, of openness, is how the city regulates new business models that challenge the status quo. And I just... Um, I ask you to cast your mind uh, around the way Airbnb and Uber has gone down in different cities. Um, some have tried to fight it, some have embraced it, some have had to have fought it, and now they embrace it. Um, so the question here is, how, how can cities play when these new disruptive models emerge? 
Uh, under the connector, we looked at things like how the city plays host to young businesses, what it does to help them find affordable office space or to meet like-minded people. Uh, and when we were thinking about how the city provides leadership from within, we looked at, for example, whether a city publishes data for others to use, whether it consumes data to optimize its own services, and so on. For each of these nine, we, we, we specified a range of detailed policy indicators that cities have under their control, things that they can act on and be held accountable for. Um, very briefly, just to give you one example, um, this is uh, the city as a customer. Um, cities tend to fundamentally underestimate the value of uh, procurement to actually drive new business activity. Um, we, we have a mantra of value for money, which often means the, the cheapest bidder. But actually, we could be using procurement as a much more strategic device to try and create the kind of city that we want. So um, we looked at specific policies that enabled that to happen. Um, we asked, do city governments write requirements into their tenders that effectively rule out young or small companies? Uh, procurement opportunities you know, listed in a single place. Um, can they deploy problem-based procurement uh, rather than sort of specifying everything to the nth degree? And so using all of these, we developed a profile uh, of the city which showed a city's relative strengths and weakness. So this is Helsinki's. Uh, as you can see, Helsinki does really well on the connector. Um, Helsinki has laid out a compelling mobility on demand vision, which I showed earlier, earlier, to fundamentally change the way public transport works in the city by 2025. Um, so we did this for 40 cities. Each of them have their own profile. Um, and it creates a different constellation of shapes and sizes, depending on how developed each city's policy making is. Um, so this is both, a, if you like, an exercise in research, but also um, a, a diagnostic tool, which actually enables city governments to look at where they stand relative uh, to other sort of similar um, cities, and then to work out, if you like, where they might prioritize action uh, for, for getting uh, better. One of the really interesting things that came out of the research is about the role of incremental adjustments in policy uh, and the great impact that they can have on an innovation ecosystem. Uh, these are adjustments that don't require a significant investment. We tend to think if we want to become a bit an innovative city, we have to do these grand sort of strategies. But actually, with a lot of these examples, um, were just the result of small changes. So BitCarrier was incubated in Barcelona, where the city acted as the first customer to their real-time wireless traffic, traffic product, which enabled the scale of this company globally. The journey planner, uh, City Mapper was only able to develop because of the release of transport data. It now operates in 22 cities. And Zopa, which is a peer-to-peer -peer lending uh, organization in the UK, was actually taken uh, on a, a tour to the US by the mayor of London to help boost their international profile. So actually what we're seeing here is um, a, a relationship uh, between startups and cities, um, where actually cities are being much more entrepreneurial and helping to try and give uh, a lot of these uh, new entities a start in life. So no one city does everything right, but there are many approaches that can be configured. Um, Barcelona has successfully redesigned the way that city conducts procurement. Uh, for example, their open challenge set out six city problems like social isolation and bike theft for entrepreneurs to develop solutions to. The city then bought those winning solutions and provided the startups with public service contracts and office space. New York has provided 100 million in public money uh, to the development of the Cornell campus on Roosevelt Island, which is a community of 600 technologists. And Boston's Office of New Urban Mechanics, great name, um, is a mayor-sponsored team that's dedicated to civic innovation. Founded in 2010, the team pilots experiments to deliver new public services of the day. Our research finds that one of the main success factors is the city's ability to reduce the distinction between innovation policy design and delivery. In other words, when dealing with startups, cities tend to act like startups themselves. They experiment to understand what works, they take risks, and they capitalize on successes quickly. And so finally, my, the third report I want to touch on, and I think I have five minutes left, good, excellent. I'll even stop for a glass of water then. I shouldn't have taken the ice, though, um, is around the role of innovation teams within government themselves. I mentioned Boston's uh, New Urban Mechanics. Um, last year, we did a piece of research looking at the growing trend for governments to set up innovation teams and labs and funds to try and understand who they were, what do they do, 
And what difference are they making uh, for their host and partner governments? And we did this with, uh, with Bloomberg Philanthropies uh, to, to look at this. We looked at, uh, we did over 80 interviews and surveys, and we looked at 20 teams, units, and funds, uh, all established by government and that are charged with making innovation happen. The I-Team, uh, they case studied are based in city, regional, and national government across city, six continents and work across the spectrum of innovation from focusing on incremental improvements to aiming for radical transformation. Uh, and in this report, which I highly recommend, not least because it covers um, some of the work that Marco did here in Finland and some work I did in Australia, um, but it tried to put together some key learnings uh, and recommendations for mayors, ministers, and other public leaders looking to create their own uh, innovation uh, capacity. So, I'm not sure, oh, that's it good. It works when you've got a really big screen, because otherwise you couldn't read that. You may still not be able to, but basically here are some of the uh, organizations we looked at uh, across uh, the world. Um, a lot of them more prevalent in America and Europe, though um, the number in Asia is rising fast, fewer in Africa. But I should say, even in the 12, 18 months since this was published, this landscape is changing uh, almost daily or monthly. Um, they're not a new phenomenon. Um, they've been around for a while. Citra, um, famously uh, here in Finland, was set up over 50 years ago. Um, but the growth of these is, is rising um, uh, exponentially. And um, what we saw uh, was uh, a range of different tools, methods, and practices that were being brought into the heart of traditional bureaucracies. Uh, they were tackling a wide range of issues, Let's see. Um, from uh, increasing murder rate, reducing murder rates uh, and increasing education attainment uh, to promoting economic growth and engaging citizens in service redesign. And, and, and this sort of spells out, I guess, the sort of the four main kind of roles that we, we saw uh, within these teams. Some of them multi uh, took on multiple roles, um, but, but certainly um, within that, each of them had a particular focus. So some were uh, looking at creating solutions for specific challenges. Uh, and they uh, would mobilize a team, uh, often a multidisciplinary team, using designers, but not solely designers, uh, and working with uh, citizens and government departments to try and create uh, new solutions. Um, others were much more about coming up with new models for engaging citizens and actually really bringing them into the decision-making process. Um, that big uh, acrylic ear that you see out is outside of the town hall in Seoul. Um, and they've made, a, they've made a virtue of creating a different kind of uh, listening relationship um, between City Hall uh, and its citizens. Um, they've run open innovation processes that have gar garnered, excellent, um, 50,000, uh, you know, 100,000 uh, ideas from their city uh, citizens. And importantly, they've actually put a lot of these into, um, into reality. So if you ever go onto the metro in Seoul, you'll see that the handles, for example, on the metro are all different heights, because actually people pointed out that actually not everyone's the same height, and we should actually try and support that diversity. And that's just one very um, uh, banal example of, of, of the, you know, what you can do differently when you listen to citizens. Um, some of the, the I-teams are about actually transforming the way that government does its role uh, and then another um, set are actually looking at the big, bigger question of how do you actually drive systems change? Um, and that's certainly has been the role that Citra has played uh, here in, in Finland. Um, so uh, in, in summary, um, three reports. I highly recommend you read them in far more detail than I've been able to, um, to give them uh, credit here. Um, but if I had to give you one message uh, on each, um, the first is that smart cities are not just about technology but it's about um, people and the interaction between the two. Secondly, we are think seeing a, a transformation in the role that cities play to bring about innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, and I think city governments should think about that as an opportunity to be much more agile, to be much more entrepreneurial, and indeed to act a lot more like a startup themselves, to take risks and to capitalize when things work. Um, and thirdly, that might mean actually creating a startup culture uh, with inside city governments and building some of those capacities, including design, but not only design, uh, to, to try and bring about change. So with that, I thank you, Kitos, and here are the links.